The tertiary structure of a polypeptide refers to the spatial arrangement of the amino acids that are found far away from one another in that polypeptide chain. Now, said another way, the, poly, the tertiary structure of the polypeptide is simply the three-dimensional arrangement of atoms, the three-dimensional shape that the polypeptide chain will take within its local environment. Now, the next question is, what exactly are the factors, what are the interactions that play a role in creating and forming that tertiary structure of the polypeptide? So, by far, the most important factor, the driving force that forms the tertiary structure is the hydrophobic effect and hydrophobic interactions. Now, that's because the majority of the proteins inside our body and inside our cells fold and create the tertiary structure in an aqueous solution, in a solution where water is the dominant solvent molecule. Now we also have van der Waals interactions, disulfide bridges, hydrogen bonds, and ionic interactions that also play a role in forming the tertiary factor, but the hydrophobic effect is that predominant force. So, as I mentioned earlier, most proteins exist in aqueous solutions and most proteins form in aqueous solutions. And what that basically means is we have the hydrophobic effect that takes place. So, remember, what the hydrophobic effect tells us is if we take nonpolar molecules, hydrophobic molecules, and place them into a solution where water is that dominant molecule, because water is a polar molecule, what will happen is we'll find that those nonpolar molecules will basically aggregate together to form larger systems, larger chunks of nonpolar molecules. And that's because that system that is formed is thermodynamically stable. Now, what does that have to do with the folding of the proteins and the formation of the tertiary structure? So, remember that proteins, our polypeptides, consist of 20 different types of amino acids. And these amino acids differ from one another based on their side chain group. So, we have different types of side chains. We have nonpolar side chains, which are hydrophobic, and we also have polar side chains, which are hydrophobic. So, it turns out, if we take our polymer of amino acids, if we take the polypeptide and place it into an aqueous solution, the hydrophobic effect and hydrophobic interactions will take into effect. And what that means is, all those amino acids that contain the nonpolar hydrophobic groups, for example, valine, alanine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and so forth, all these different nonpolar side chains will end up aggregating together in the core at the center of that protein. While all those amino acids that contain the polar side chains, for example, lysine or arginine, aspartate, and so forth, all these charged and polar amino acids will be found on the surface of that protein. So this is what we mean by the hydrophobic effect essentially dictating the way that the tertiary structure is actually formed. So let's suppose, let's take a look at the following diagram. So in this diagram we have our protein. So let's suppose that these red regions here are hydrophobic regions. So let's label these as hydro. Uh, that is not spelled correctly. Uh, one moment. So we have So we have these hydrophobic red sections and these, uh, these blue sections here are hydrophilic. So remember, hydrophilic is water-loving and hydrophobic is water-hating. So what happens is when we place him into a solution that contains water as a solvent, so these are the water molecules here, these blue sections will tend to point on the surface, lie on the surface, while these red sections, these amino acids, 
acids that contain hydrophobic uh, side chains will tend to aggregate at the center and form the core of that protein. So a protein in an aqueous environment will have a hydrophobic core and a hydrophilic surface. Now, if we go into that core, inside that core, we have many of these hydrophobic nonpolar side chains that are packed together. Now, what types of interactions will we find between those nonpolar side chains? Well, the interactions are known as London dispersion forces, also known as Van der Waals interactions. And these are the interactions that exist between the instantaneous dipole moments on those nonpolar side chains. And even though on an individual basis, these instantaneous dipole interactions might be very weak because we have many of these nonpolar side chains in the core, we have many of these van der Waals interactions, and that aggregate creates a relatively substantial effect that binds those amino acids in the core together and holds them in place so that that they are away and don't interact with the water molecules found in close proximity outside of that protein. Now, these interactions are, inter, uh, are, are intermolecular interactions. What about intramolecular interactions? So, we also have a specific type of intramolecular interaction, a covalent bond, that can also dictate that tertiary structure. And these are known as disulfide bridges or disulfide bonds. So, it turns out that if we have two cysteine amino acids that are in close proximity, if an oxidation reaction takes place, we can form a covalent bond between our sulfur group. So basically an oxidation reaction takes place, we take away this H atom, this H atom, we take away two electrons, and we form the following single covalent bond between the two sulfurs. And this is known as a disulfide bond or a, dus, a, a, a disulfide bridge. So some proteins, specifically those proteins that are destined to be in the extracellular environment, these polypeptides can be cross-linked by these disulfide bonds. And once we form the unit of these two cysteine molecules, that is known as a cysteine. So this spelling and this spelling are not the same. So this is pronounced cysteine, this is pronounced cysteine. So we have the hydrophobic interactions that basically drive the formation of that tertiary structure and then that hydrophobic core is held together by van der Waals interaction. And we can also have a special type of covalent bond known as the, dis uh, the disulfide bridge that also holds our structure together. So here we have one disulfide bond, a second disulfide bond, and a third disulfide bond between the, these cysteine amino acids. Now, we can also have hydro, uh, hydrogen bonds and we can have ionic interactions. Now, if we examine those polar molecules on the surface, the uh, side chains of those polar amino acids can basically interact and form hydrogen bonds with the water molecules that are found in close proximity and that can stabilize the structure, the tertiary structure of our polypeptide. And finally, we can also have ionic interactions. Now remember, certain amino acids contain side chains that carry a full charge. So some amino acids contain side chains that carry a positive charge. For example, lysine and arginine, these carry a full positive charge on their side chain. We also have acidic amino acids, and these are the amino acids that carry a full negative charge on their side chain. And so, for example, if we have the amino acid lysine that contains a positive charge on a side chain is in close proximity with our amino acid aspartate which contains a full negative charge on that particular side chain and, in, and, and if these two are close enough they can form an ionic bond and that ionic bond can also stabilize the tertiary structure of that polypeptide. 
So we conclude that the tertiary structure of that polypeptide, although it is affected by many different factors, the main driving force that leads to the formation of our tertiary structure of that polypeptide are these hydrophobic interactions. And that's because the majority of these proteins are folded in an aqueous solution in a solution that contains water as that dominant solvent molecule.